That's no good. Turn it off. Stop it. Turn it off. That won't work. It's no good. But what do you make a trailer for? To give the public an idea of what kind of a picture to expect. But, boss, we thought... Hilarious, romantic, tender, exciting. Make up your minds. It can't be all of those things. Mr. Shape, if you'd look at the picture... I don't have to look at the picture. I know you're wrong. Tender, exciting. Why, they're practically opposites. You've got to decide what kind of a picture this is. Is it a romantic love story? Is it an exciting thriller? Is it a hilarious comedy? Make up your minds. Now go to work and fix it up. Is that so? Oh, there's one scene between John Payne and Maureen O'Hara. Well, he's trying to prove... No, I'm not going to spoil it for you. You go and see it. So I see. How are you, Peggy Ann? <laughs> I'm fine now that I know I didn't hit you. Tell me, have you seen Miracle on 34th Street? Three times, and it's simply groovy. Mr. Gwen's just wonderful. You know, we work together in Bob's Son of Battle. Yeah, I saw it. He's great in it. Wait till you see him in this. You'll love him, and you'll love the picture, too. I tell you, it's a groovy movie. Don't you think so, Dick? Dick! Yeah. Dick Hames, I didn't see you. Well, I've been on the floor. That sudden stop got me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but seriously, Peggy's right. That Miracle on 34th Street is really something. You know, with me, moving pictures have got to move. They've got to be exciting and different. And this thing is really it. It's the most unusual story that I've ever seen. In the last 20 minutes of the picture, had me sitting on the edge of my seat every second of the time. And what a finish. Yeah, maybe I ought to take a look at well, it. Well, if you run it again, tell me about it. Okay, we're ready. the greatest picture I have ever made. And I've got the angle on the trailer. Boys, we've got to get across to the public that that picture has everything. Why, it's hilarious. It's romantic. It's tender. It's charming. It's delightful. It's exciting. And it's groovy. Yes, yes, Mr. Schaefer. That does it, boss. Mr. Schaefer, you've got a great idea. Naturally. Now, I'll tell you what we do.
Lux presents Hollywood. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Judy Garland in The Wizard of Oz. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Holiday greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. I trust you've all had a perfect Christmas. Wonderful presents, uh, too much dinner, and lots of merry company. But sometime during the day, I'm sure you've said, Christmas really belongs to the children. And so, before they have to leave their toys and cowboy suits, we want to tell them a story. And you'll want to listen, too. Because it's The Wizard of Oz. One of those wonderful Oz books that we've all loved since they were written by L. Frank Baum 50 years ago. metro golden Mayor turned The Wizard of Oz into a screen classic and a lovely little singer into a star, one of the most talented stars of Hollywood, Judy Garland. Audiences have asked her to be brought back again and again to be entranced by Judy's performance and those fascinating Oz characters, the Scarecrow, the Tin Woodsman, the Cowardly Lion and the delightful little people, the Munchkins. Now it's off to The Wizard of Oz, starring Judy Garland as Dorothy. This is the story of a girl named Dorothy, who lives with her aunt and uncle on a farm way out in Kansas. Her dearest friend is her dog, Toto. But Dorothy has other friends, too. The farmhands, for instance. Zeke and Hunk and Hickory. Hey, what's your hurry, honey? What's wrong? It's Toto, Hickory. Toto. Toto? Something wrong with that dog? Well, he looks fine to me. Well, he, he is, Zeke, but he almost wasn't. Miss Gulch hit him just because he gets in her garden and chases her nasty old cat. Oh, sure, honey, sure. Only we're busy, see? I got them hogs to get in. Now, look, Dorothy, you just ain't using your head about that mean old Miss Gulch. You'd think you didn't have a brain at all. Hunk, I have so got brain. Well, use a man. When you're walking home with Toto, just keep away from Miss Gulch's place. Your head ain't made of straw, you know. Gosh, Dorothy, that Miss Gulch ain't nobody to be afraid of. Have a little courage, that's all. Courage, Steve? Why, sure. You know, like like me. Well, look who's talking. You, courage. There ain't a man in the county who scares easier than you. <laughs> well, well, uh, that's a fine thing to say. Look out, Steve. That pig's gonna bite you. Where? What pig? Help, help! <laughs> you see what I mean? <laughs> now, cut that out. Scaring a man half to death like that. Here now, here. What's all this jabber weapon when there's work to be done? It's about Toto, Eddie M. Miss Gulf says she's going to go and get the sheriff and... Now, I thought about... you and Hickory were supposed to be fixing that wagon. Oh, we are, Miss Gale. Hammer that ranch, Hickory. And feed them hogs, Zeke, before they worry themselves into anemia. Yes, ma'am. Now then, child, what's your trouble? Eddie M., really, do you know what Miss Gulf said she was going to do to Toto? She said she was... There. Gonna... There you go again, imagining things. You know, you always get yourself into a fret over nothing. Oh, but this time... Now, you just help us all out this afternoon. Find yourself a place where you won't get into any trouble. i got to get back in the house. Yes, Andy, I'm... <sighs> Come on, Toto. <laughs> Do you suppose there is such a place, Toto, where there isn't any trouble? There must be... Not a place you can get to by a boat or a train, but it's far, far away. Behind the moon, beyond the rain. Second, Miss Gar, surely you don't mean that. Why, that little that dog's, dog's a just... menace to the community. I'm taking that animal to the sheriff and make sure he's destroyed. Destroyed? 
Oh, no, no, please. You, you must Oh, uh, honey, we didn't know you were there. Toto didn't know he was doing anything wrong. I'm the one who ought to be punished, Uncle Henry. I let him go in her garden. There's a law protecting folks against animals like that. No, no, please. Well, we can't go against the law, Doris. Now you're being smart. Give him to me. No, I won't let you take him. I won't. You're a witch, a wicked old witch. Doris? Oh, please, Auntie M, please. Oh, I got him at last. And there's nothing any of you can do about it. Toto! Toto! Now, come on, Dorothy. Cheer up, honey. Please, not. I don't feel like talking. Not to anybody. Not even to Toto? Oh, you know he's gone. You know Miss Gulch took him away. I know something else, too, honey. Toto must have jumped out of her basket and run back home because there's a little brown and white dog looking all over for you. Oh, oh, Toto. Toto, you're back. Toto, Toto. You came back to me, Toto. Oh, I thought you were dead. I, I... They'll be coming after you. Miss Gulch and the sheriff, maybe. We've got to run away. Now, Toto, or no one will ever find us or, or, or take you away again. Yes, Toto, we've got to run away. It's getting dark, Toto. I, I think maybe there's a storm coming. But we'll just keep going, won't we? We're not afraid. It's, it's just like Zeke said. Courage. I see what you mean. A wagon. A horse in the wagon and, and a man. And there's a big sign on the wagon. Wait, I think I can see what it says. Professor Marvel. Acclaimed by the crown heads of Europe. Let him read your past, present, and future in his crystal. Well, who might you be? Uh, I guess it's all right, Toto. He he looks like a nice man. Well, if you're not going to tell me who you are, suppose I tell you. But how can you? <laughs> Professor Marvel knows all tells all. Your past, present, and future for 25 cents, a quarter of a dollar. Uh, two bits, if you prefer. Oh, I'm sorry, but I don't think I can afford it. Oh, so your name's Dorothy, is it? How did you know that? Well, on the one hand, perhaps I saw you in my crystal, and on the other hand, perhaps a fellow named Zeke passed by a while ago looking for you. Oh, I see. Uh, but don't you think for one minute I couldn't have figured it out for myself why Professor Marvel and his magic crystal have amazed royalty and peasantry alike the world over? Oh, please, Professor, can't we go with you and see all the crowned heads of Europe? Oh, do you know any? Uh, oh, uh, you, you, you mean the sign on my wagon? I, I don't suppose you could take just a... A little look in your magic crystal for me. Uh, for nothing, I mean. Matter of fact, young lady, I already have. Oh, just practicing, you understand. And you know what I saw? What? A woman. Tears in her eyes. Careworn. A woman looking for someone. And her name is... Uh... Uh, Auntie M? Kindly allow me to supply the answers. Her name is Auntie M. Someone has almost broken her heart. Me? Well, someone she loved very much. And then just before the crystal went dark, I, I saw her put her hand over her heart and drop, drop down on the floor. Oh, no. No. You don't suppose she could really be sick, do you? Oh, I've, I've got to go home right away. Go home? I thought you were going along with me. Oh, but I've got to get to her right away. Toto, come on, Toto. We're going up. Goodbye, Professor, and thank you. But don't waste any time. There's a windstorm blowing up. Oh, poor little kid. Hope she gets home all right. Everything's rushing through the sky. Barns and buggies. 
And there goes our chicken roost. Toto, we're caught in the cyclone. We're right up inside the middle of the cyclone. But, but there's old Mr. Gallagher in his rowboat. Mr. Gallagher! Howdy, Miss Cars. He's trying to freeze. He ain't it. And Uncle Henry Pepper. Bossy! Bossy! I, I don't understand this at all. Things are flying around so fast that I can... I can... Look! Miss Goat! <laughs> now she's on a broomstick. She is a witch. Don't worry, Toto. I won't let her... You stop moving, Toto. We're standing still. Oh, we can't stand still up in the middle of the air. We're going to fall. We are falling. We're falling. We're falling. We're falling. We've landed. But where? Where, where are we? Well, it's a regular little village. And look, houses and streets and trees and fountains. <coughs> yes, you're quite right. That is our house over there. We must have bounced out when we landed. But what place is this? <coughs> I have a feeling we're being watched. I have another feeling we're not in Kansas anymore. Well, we must be over the rainbow. Toto, look. There's a big bubble coming down the street, and, and there's someone inside it. A lady, and she's stepping out of it. Oh, now I know we're not in Kansas. Tell me, please, are you a good witch or a bad witch? Me? Oh, I'm, I'm not a witch at all. I'm Dorothy Gale from Kansas. Oh, well, I am a little muddled. The munchkins just summoned me because... Uh, munchkins? You happen to be standing in the very center of their village, you know. And uh, they sent for you? Because some new witch has just dropped a house on the Wicked Witch of the East. See? Over there. Oh, but that's our farmhouse from, from Kansas. Now look where I point my wand. <gasps> two red slippers. Exactly. Two red slippers protruding from under the farmhouse. All that's left of the Wicked Witch of the East. And since it's your farmhouse, obviously you're responsible. Oh, you've made the munchkins very happy, my dear. If, uh... If you please, what are munchkins? The little people who live in this land. It's munchkin land, and you are now their national heroine. And who are you? Why, I'm Glinda, of course, the Witch of the North. Witch? But you're beautiful. Thank you. You see, only bad witches are ugly, and I'm a very good witch. Now, suppose I call the munchkin. Come out, come out. Well, munchkins... Have you nothing to say to her? Where's the mayor? Oh, there you are. Uh, first of all, Miss Dorothy, a little floral tribute. Oh, what beautiful flowers. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, there will be, of course, a parade and general celebration with a brass band and a regiment of cavalry. Meanwhile, oh, let the joyous news be spread. The wicked old witch at last is dead! <laughs> She was dead. She is dead. This one on the broomstick is her sister, the Wicked Witch of the West. It seems even worse than the other one. Silence! I demand silence! It's Miss Gulch! That's who it is, Miss Gulch! Hard of hearing, are you? I said silence. Now then, who killed my sister? Was it you? No, no. It was an accident. I didn't mean to kill anyone. Well, my little pretty, I can cause accidents too. Aren't you forgetting the ruby slippers? The slippers. My sister's slippers. There they are. Still on our feet over there. Well, I'll just take them. Just a moment, if you please. Ruby slippers, slippers red. Leave the feet of she who's dead. I summon my authority and bid you serve Miss Dorothy. The slippers. What are you doing to them? Now they're on my feet. You give them back to me. Never. There they are, and there they'll stay. You nasty little girl. They're of no use to you. Don't be frightened of a Dorothy. You stay out of this, Glinda. I'll fix you as well. Rubbish. You have no power here. Be gone before somebody drops a house on you, too. Very well. I'll bide my time. As for you, my fine lady... You heard what she said. Be gone. I'll get you yet, my pretty. And your little dog, too. Ha, ha, ha. 
<laughs> Away, broomstick! Away! <laughs> it's all right, Munchkin. Don't hide your faces. She's gone. <laughs> now then, my dear. The sooner you get out of Oz, the safer you'll sleep. Oh, I'd give anything to get out of Oz. But how? Which is the way back to Kansas? Kansas? The only person who might know would be the great and wonderful Wizard of Oz himself. The Wizard of Oz? Is he good or is he wicked? Oh, very good, but very mysterious. He lives far off in the Emerald City. Uh, did you by any chance bring your broomstick with you? Uh, no, I'm afraid I didn't. Well, then you'll have to walk. The munchkins will see you safely to the border. And remember, never let those ruby slippers off your feet, or you'll be at the mercy of the wicked witch of the West. But, but how do I start for the Emerald City? All you have to do is follow that yellow brick road. Help her, munchkins. The yellow brick road. Helpers, attention. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow the... In a few moments, we'll bring you Act Two of The Wizard of Oz. And now, here is our Hollywood reporter, Libby Collins, to give us the Lux Radio Theater's movie news of the week. Tonight, John, it's the new Howard Hughes production, Vendetta, starring a lovely newcomer to Hollywood. She's Faith Demerg, and she's been given just the role her dark, exotic beauty calls for. This RKO picture tells the story of a family feud in old-time Corsica. And Faith plays the girl who vows to avenge her father's murder. Quite an intense melodrama, Libby. Isn't that a terrific set they built for the dueling scene? Oh, yes, indeed. No California landscape could quite convey the bleakness of that wild Corsican country. So they built the whole thing on a soundstage. Faith Domergue is photographed in dark costumes throughout. Of course, they set off her startling beauty all the more. There's a highly dramatic, uh, exciting quality about her acting, too. Well, she's quite a perfectionist, you know. Spent years of study before attempting her first screen role. And, John, Faith Demerig is a perfectionist about beauty, too. Naturally, her skin has to look soft and smooth in the close-ups. That's why she depends on daily facials with Lux Toilet Soap. She says it's a care that really works. Lux Soap is just right to protect delicate skin, Libby. No wonder so many famous stars say they wouldn't be without this gentle soap. Yes, John. Active lather does wonders for the skin. It's so easy to take a Lux Soap facial, too. You just smooth the rich lather well in, rinse with warm water, follow with a quick cold rinse, and pat with a soft towel to dry. It works like a charm to give your complexion quick, new beauty. Yes, Libby, that's a tip for smart women everywhere. For thorough, protecting care, there's nothing finer than Lux Toilet Soap. When you see Faith Domergue in Howard Hughes' exciting new picture, Vendetta, notice the smooth perfection of her skin. You'll want to try her daily active lather facials. So why not get Hollywood's own beauty soap tomorrow? Remember, nine out of ten screen stars use fragrant white Lux toilet soap. Now, Mr. William Keeley, our producer. Act two of The Wizard of Oz, starring Judy Garland as Dorothy. <laughs> With the magic slippers on her feet, her dog Toto at her heels, and the little munchkins marching on ahead, Dorothy is on her way to the Wizard of Oz. They've reached the border of Munchkinland, and the little people have waved goodbye and disappeared. Well, Toto, now what? <coughs> We're still on the yellow brick road, but now it goes in two different directions. Which way do we go? Pardon me, but that way is a very nice way. <coughs> Who said that? Oh, don't be silly, Toto. That's just a scarecrow in the cornfield. Scarecrows don't talk. On the other hand, that way is very pleasant also. Why, he did talk. Is there anything so unusual about that? Well, yes, there is. And why do you shake your head? I mean, both yes and no at the same time. Oh, that's my trouble. I never can make up my mind about anything. <laughs> oh? The fact is, I haven't got a brain. Let's take a look at my head, you see? It's straw. Just straw like the rest of me. But how can you talk if you don't have a brain? Oh, some people without brains do an awful lot of talking. <laughs> don't they? 
Yes, I guess you're right. Oh, oh, what's he doing, your dog? Toto, why, he's licking your hand. Oh, that's what I thought. I, I guess I don't scare him, huh? <laughs> no, of course not. Yeah, I can't even scare a crow. They come from miles around. They pick off my straw for their nest. It's, it's not at all flattering. <laughs> I'm, I'm a failure just because I haven't got a brain. Well, what would you do with a brain if you had one? Do? Why, if I had a brain, I could... Wonderful. Just imagine a scarecrow singing and dancing. Why, if our scarecrow back in Kansas could do that... What's Kansas? Well, that's where Toto and I come from. And I want to get back there so badly that I'm going all the way to the Emerald City to get the Wizard of Oz to help me. A wizard? Do you think if I went along, he could give me some brains, maybe? Oh, I think you'd better stay here. I've got a witch mad at me, and you might get into trouble. Oh, but I'm not afraid of a witch. I'm not afraid of anything. Oh, so maybe a lighted match. Well, since you're made out of straw, I can hardly blame you for that. Oh, won't you take me with you, please? Of course I will. Gladly. Oh, hooray! I'm going to leave the cornfield. And see a wizard. I hope. What are we waiting for? <laughs> Scarecrow? Huh? Do you see what I see? Well, not knowing what you see, how can I say that what I see is what you... Oh, wait a minute. Look, over there. That's just what I mean at the edge of the forest. It's a man. A man made out of tin and holding an axe. Come on, Dorothy. Be careful, please. You too, Tony. Look, look here. Here on the grass. An oil can. Oil can! Did you say something? Oh, no. He did. Oil can! He said oil can. He wants me to oil him. My mouth! He said his mouth. All right, just a minute now. Oh, my goodness! Oh, joy! Oh, bliss! I can talk again! I can talk! Oh, oh, my arms, please. My elbows. Oh, oh that's wonderful, wonderful. A am, I, am I doing it right? Oh, yes, yes. What a relief. I've held this axe up for ages. But my goodness, how did you ever get like this in the first place? Oh, well, uh, about a year ago, I was chopping that tree when suddenly it began to rain. I rusted so solid, I haven't been able to move since. Well, you're perfect now. Perfect. Just bang on my chest if you think I'm perfect. Go ahead, bang on it. Beautiful. What an echo. You see? Empty. The tinsmith forgot to give me a heart. No, no heart. heart. No heart. Oh. All hollow. And believe me, not having a heart, well, presents problems. Well, I certainly see what you mean. You were whispering, you and him, while I was singing. Well, we were just wondering if you'd care to go with us to the Emerald City. Then you could ask the Wizard of Oz for a heart. But suppose he wouldn't give me one when we got there. Oh, but he will. He must. We've come such a long way already. Ah, you call that long, my pretty? Why, you've just begun. <laughs> Who's that? Who's laughing? The witch, the wicked witch. Well, my two fine gentlemen... Helping the little lady along, are you? Well, stay away from her. Oh, oh yeah? I'll stuff a mattress with you, you straw man. And you, I'll use that tin carcass for a beehive. <laughs> Gosh, what a witch. Want to play ball, Scarecrow? Well, here. No, no, look out, it's a ball of fire. Oh, no, 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 no. Stand still, stand still. I'll stamp out the fire with my ten feet. There. There, you can move now. Oh, much obliged, Tin Woods. Oh, yes, we both are. But I'm still not afraid of her. I'll see that you get safely to the wizard now, whether I get a brain or not. Stuff a mattress with me. Ha! Mm. And I'll see that you reach the wizard whether I get a heart or not. Oh, you're the best friends anybody ever had. And it's funny, but I feel as if I'd known you all the time. You're just like Hunk and, and, and Hickory. I, I couldn't have known you, could I? I certainly don't see how. Uh, I guess it doesn't really matter. We know each other now, all right. That's right. We do. <laughs> then to us, to us. Oh, 
Uh, d- does anybody happen to know where we are? Oh, uh, that's easy. We're in a forest. And I don't like it. It's so dark and, and creepy. <laughs> Toto, Toto, come back. Stay on the path. He sees something behind that bush. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so do I. I think I do, too. It's a lion. A lion. He's coming this way. Stay where you are. Ah! <laughs> Put him up. Put up your fist. Ah! I'll fight you with one poor tie behind my back. I'll fight you standing on one foot. Stand up and fight. Ah! I'll swallow you first, you little peewee dog. Shame on you. You let that little dog alone. Let him alone. <laughs> no. Why did you have to slap me for? <laughs> I didn't bite him. <laughs> Look, the lion. He's crying. Well, you tried to bite him. Well, you didn't have to go and hit me, did you? <laughs> Is my nose bleeding? Oh, of course not. My goodness, you're nothing but a great big coward. <laughs> you're right, I'm a coward. I haven't any courage at all. <laughs> Do you suppose the wizard would help him, too? I don't see why not. Why don't you come with us, Lion? We're on our way to see the Wizard of Oz and get the Tin Woodsman a heart. And him a brain. And I'm sure he could give you some courage. (laughs) Well, wouldn't you feel degraded to be seen in the company of a cowardly lion? (laughs) I would. (laughs) No, of course not. Here, you, you better take my handkerchief. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You've been so nice to me. Now, please stop crying. I'll try. But, but how did you get this way in the first place, Lion? Well, if you can spare the time, it, it was like this. Little do they know I, too, was hiding in the forest. I'll still get those ruby slippers, and then my power will be the greatest in Oz. And woe to those who try to stop me. I fall, broom sticks away! Look, everybody, look! Emerald City, oh, at last, at last! Emerald City, eh? God. It's all green. And with turrets and towers, and look how big it is. But how do we get in? This wall goes to all around everything. It most certainly does. Look at the top of the wall. Oh, who are you? That's my question. Who are you? Well, if you'll let us in, we'll be glad to tell you. Let you in, huh? Well, you look harmless enough. Open the gate. Of Emerald City! We can go in. The gates are opening. Well, that's the general idea of gates, isn't it? <laughs> Kindly step forward and state your business. Uh, we want to see the wizard, please. The, 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 the wizard? Oh, but nobody can see the great Oz. Nobody's ever seen the great Oz. Even I have never seen him. Oh, please. The good witch of the north sent me here. Prove it. She's wearing the ruby slippers she gave me, you see? Oh, bust my buttons. So she is. Then you'll take us to the wizard? There you go again. Wizard. Uh, well, uh, well, yeah, of course, uh, wizard. Uh, meanwhile, you'd all better wait... I beg th- your pardon, sir? Well, well, what is it now, good grief, man? Can't you... I no one can serve the public square. No, who who wants The me? entire population of Emerald City. There's something going on, sir, and I don't like the looks of it. No, no, no. What's everyone so excited about? Don't you see? Up there in the sky. Huh? Well, that's quite a trick, isn't it? Dorothy, it's sky riding. Letters of black smoke all across the sky. Well, well, what does it say? It's the Wicked Witch. It says, it says, surrender, Dorothy. <laughs> Dorothy? 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 The Wicked Witch! To the wizard! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody's going to bother the wizard now. 
The great and powerful Oz has the situation well in hand, I hope, so you can all go home. Go on, scatter. You draw flies. But, if you please, sir, we want to see the wizard right away. Certainly not. Not nobody, not no how. But she's Dorothy. The witch is Dorothy? Nope, not even you. Oh, please. Please, it's the, it's the only way I'll ever be able to get home. Not nobody, not no how. Annie M was so good to me, and I never appreciated it. Running away, hurting her feelings. What's that? Professor Marvel said she was sick. She may be dying, and it's, it's all my fault. <laughs> I'll get you to the wizard somehow. <laughs> He's trying to. Oh, you see, I I had an Aunt M once myself. Oh, this is all highly irregular, but just follow me. <laughs> Gosh, he just left us in this chamber. It's so dark and echoey, huh? He said the wizard would be waiting for us. <laughs> I'm closing my eyes. Did you just... Tell me when it's all over. <laughs> Silence! Who was that? I am Paul, the great and powerful. But, but we, we can't see anybody. Silence! You shall never see me. But if you please, we, we must tell you something. Nobody ever tells me anything. I know everything. You... You're a little girl who wants to go home. And you, Tinman? Yes, Your Honor. Clinking and clattering for the heart. And you? Me, your wizardry? A billowing beggar of both these breakfast who beg for a break. And you, Your Honor? Oh. Well, lie, lie and wake up. The wizard will be awfully mad. Oh, you, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. I am. Frightening the poor cowardly lion like that when he came to you for help. Silence! The magnificent Oz has every intention of granting your request, but you must serve to a worthy. Oh, we will. We'll do anything. Very well. Bring me the broomstick on the wicked witch of the west. Oh, but... But if we do that, why, well, we'll have to kill her to get it. Bring me her full stick and I'll grant your request. But well, what if she kills us first? <laughs> Zion! Leave the great gate of Emerald City. Follow the arrow of God, call the forest, and head to the witch's castle. Now go, go, and we run, if you can. The... Haunted forest, the witch's castle. Well, I I guess there's nothing else to do but go. That's the spirit, Dorothy. Come on, lion. We're not afraid. We'll get that old broomstick. <laughs> <laughs> And they think I don't know about it. They think they'll take me by surprise. Ah, at last I'll have them in my power. The little girl, her nasty dog, and the magic ruby slippers. <laughs> In just a few moments, we'll bring you Act Three of The Wizard of Oz. I particularly want you to meet our guest for tonight, uh, Paula Stone, writer-producer for MGM Radio Attractions. She'll bring us news of the world premiere in Hollywood last Wednesday of Metro-Golden-Mare's great picture, The Magnificent Yankee. As commentator at the premiere, you interviewed the many stars who attended, didn't you, Paula? Yes, I did, Mr. Keeley. It was one of the most thrilling evenings I've experienced. Over a hundred stars were there. To cheer for Louis Calhoun and Anne Harding, of course. Oh, yes. Everyone was so enthusiastic about the picture. And the superb performance turned in by Louis Calhoun as Justice Holmes and Anne Harding as his devoted wife. There's a picture as rousing as a brass band. The distinguished career of one of our greatest men is presented in the authentic atmosphere of our nation's capital. 
why you actually feel the march of stirring events. It's an exciting treatment of our recent history, but it's also a beautiful love story. Yes, indeed. The deep attachment of Justice Holmes for his wife is something to warm the heart. Anne Harding brings dignity and beauty to her role in The Magnificent Yankee. And she's completely charming and very lovely, too. Of course, as you might expect, like so many famous stars I interview from time to time, she gives credit to Lux Care for her skin and just keeping it right for the cameras. Well, after all, Miss Stone, it's Hollywood's own beauty soap, you know. Oh, yes, Mr. Kennedy. And Lux Soap in the big bath size is just as popular. I know I wouldn't be without it. There's nothing more luxurious after a busy day than a refreshing Lux Soap bath. There's something special about the lather. Rich and creamy, even in hardest water. Yes, it leaves skin really fresh. Fragrant, too, with a nice, delicate perfume. No wonder screen stars prefer this satin-smooth bath kick. Thank you, Miss Paula Stone, for being here tonight. Now, here's a shopping hint for the ladies in our audience. Get the generous bath size Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow. Enjoy its luxurious lather and delightful perfume. You'll discover why screen stars... Say it makes you sure of all over Lux loveliness. Nine out of ten famous Hollywood stars use fragrant white Lux toilet soap. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The curtain rises on Act Three of The Wizard of Oz, starring Judy Garland as Dorothy. Well, if Dorothy is ever to get back home to Kansas... And if I'm ever to have a brain... And me a heart... And me courage... Then Dorothy must first get the broomstick of the Wicked Witch and bring it back to The Wizard of Oz. But if the wizard knows everything, the wicked witch, unfortunately, knows quite a lot herself. Now, in her bleak and dismal castle, she gloats over a newly captured prisoner. <laughs> Excuse me for laughing, but it was so easy to capture you that I can't help it. At least my friends got away. Toto, too. What do I care about them? It's you I wanted. You and the magic ruby slippers. I had every warrior slave in this castle on the watch for you. Now, give me those slippers. No, no. The good witch told me not to. Fool that I am. I should know the slippers will never come off as long as you're alive. You... you mean... Ah! Now, how shall I do it? I think I'll make up a special batch of poison. Yes, that ought to do it. Some nice, fresh poison. <laughs> <laughs> Look, it's Dorothy's dog. Sitting there, Ryan, look. Oh, we're gonna... Now, all right. He'll lead the witch's soldiers right here to our hiding place. No, no. He's come to take us to Dorothy. Up there in the castle. We can't fail her now. We can't. I'll go. Witch or no witch, I'll tear him apart. I'll knock him cold. I may not come out alive, but I'm going in there. Oh, Ryan, that, that, that's wonderful. There's only one thing I want you fellas to do. What's that? Oh, talk me out of it. <laughs> oh, no, you don't. Come what may, we're going to rescue Dorothy. All right, Toto, show us the way. <laughs> this is the room. Toto sniffed her out. Dorothy. Who, who is it? It's us. We've come to save you. Open the door. I can't. She's locked me in here. Tin Man, your axe chopped on the door. But that'll make a noise in the guards. Who cares the... about the guards? We'll save you, Dorothy. We'll save you. She'll be back any minute. Hurry, please. Here goes the door. Stand back, Dorothy. Oh, I knew you'd come. I knew it. And Toto, Toto. Oh, we'll have you out of this castle before you oh, can say, Jack Gro <laughs> The witch, the wicked witch. Uh, my little party's just about to begin. Good! Seize them! Seize them! <laughs> Thought you were being pretty foxy, huh? Now I've got the whole lot of you. Let's see. How shall I stop 
lots of fun. You first, Scarecrow. Ha, 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 ha. How about another ball of fire? No, 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 Oh, thank you, Dorothy. Thank you. Oh, you cursed brat. You've killed me. You've killed me. Nonsense. I, I just happened oh. to splash some water on you, too. Oh. Look, the witch. She's melting. Oh, what a world. What a world. Who would have thought that a good little girl like you could destroy my beautiful wickedness? I'm going. I'm going fast. Oh. She is gone. Look, nothing but a little steaming puddle. She dead. You've killed the wicked witch. But I didn't mean to kill her. I I didn't know that water... Was... You don't understand. Now we're all free. She enslaved us. But now her spell over all of us is broken. Hey! All hail to Dorothy. The wicked witch is dead. Hey! Hey! Here, take it with you. Now we can go back to the wizard. And tell him the wicked witch is dead. Onward to Emerald City. I still can't believe my eyes. You've come back. Back to Emerald City. And we did exactly what the great Oz told us to do. Here, here's the witch's broomstick. And now, if you don't mind taking us to the wizard... You see, he promised us... Uh, uh, promised to all your broomstick. <laughs> what an unhappy situation. Unhappy? After all, we've gone... Oh, I, I'm glad there's no one else around to hear this. Hear what? Oh, little girl, there is no great and powerful wizard of Oz. That is, I am the wizard. But he spoke to us himself. I spoke to you. Oh, it was no great trick, a dark room, a few smoke powders. Your, your own imaginations did the rest. Why, you... you humbug. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, you're a very bad man. Oh, no, my dear. I'm just a very bad wizard. <laughs> what about the heart you promised Tin Man? And Scarecrow's brain. Well, anybody can have a brain. That's a very mediocre commodity. Well, I don't have one. Then listen a moment. Back where I come from, we have great universities where men go to become deep thinkers. And when they come out, they know how to think just fine. And with no more brains than you have. What? But they have one thing you haven't got, a diploma. Therefore, by virtue of the authority in me vested by the Universitatis Committee, um, I hereby confer upon you the honorary degree of T.H.D. T.H.D.? Doctor of Thinkology. Here's your diploma. Oh, oh Scarecrow, how wonderful. But, but what about me? I'm still a coward. I think. Of course not. You are merely under the unfortunate delusion that because you run away from danger, you have no courage. A simple matter of confusing courage with wisdom. <laughs> oh, joy, oh, rapture, I've got a brain. <laughs> Back where I come from, Lion, we have men who are called heroes. Yet they have no more courage than you have. But they do have one thing you haven't got. A medal. Medal? Therefore... For meritorious conduct and conspicuous bravery against wicked witches, I award you the Triple Cross. The Triple Cross? <laughs> oh, shucks, sir. It was nothing. <laughs> you are now a member of the Legion of Courage. As for you, my galvanized petitioner, you want a heart. You don't know how lucky you are not to have one. Hearts will never be practical until they can be made unbreakable. I still want one. Back where I come from, there are men who do nothing but good deeds all day long. And their hearts are no bigger than yours. They're called philanthropists. But they have one thing you haven't got. A testimonial. Testimonial? Therefore, in consideration of your kindness, I present you with this small token of our esteem and affection. A heart. It is a heart. Just remember that a heart is not judged by how much you love, but by how much you are loved. Listen, <laughs> it ticks. My heart even ticks. But, but what about Dorothy? 
You, uh, you still want to go back to Kansas, hmm? Oh, I do. I do. I wish I could help you, child, but I can. You, you mean I, I'll never get home? But it, it, it's really rather pleasant here once you get to know the place. And we want you to stay, Dorothy. You see, we love you, you and Toto. And I love you, but what am I to do? What was that? Look what's coming. A bubble. Who's been blowing bubbles around here? Hey, there's somebody in it. It's Glinda. Glinda's a good witch. Oh, help me. Help me. But you don't need my help, child. You've always had the power to go back to Kansas. I have. Then why didn't you tell her before? Because she wouldn't have believed me. She had to learn by herself. Have you learned, Dorothy? Well, I... I think that... That it wasn't enough just to want to see Uncle Henry and Auntie M. And it's that... If I ever go looking for my heart's desire again... I won't look any further than my own backyard. Because if it isn't there... I never really lost it to begin with. Is that right? That's all it is, my dear. Now, your magic slippers will take you home in two seconds. Oh, that, that's too wonderful to be true. Only it's, it's going to be so hard to really say goodbye. I, I love you all so much. Goodbye, Tin Man. Oh, don't cry. You rust so dreadfully. No, I... No, I have a heart. It's breaking. Goodbye, Lion. Oh, I know it isn't right, but I I'm going to miss the way you used to holler for help before you found your courage. I never would have found it if it hadn't been for you. <laughs> Scarecrow, I think I'll miss you most of all. Goodbye, dear friend. Are you ready now? <laughs> yes, I'm ready. Say goodbye, Toto. <laughs> now close your eyes and think to yourself, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's no No place like home. No place like home. It's Aunt Em, darling. Oh, Henry, look, she's opening her eyes. Oh, Annie M, it is you. Yes, darling. Hello there. Can I come in? I just dropped by because I heard the little girl got caught in the big cyclone. Well, got a bad knock in the head, Professor Marvel, but she's coming around now. We, we thought for a minute she was going to leave us. Sure had us worried, Dorothy. <gasps> Why, you remember me, your old pal Hunk? Oh. And me, Hickory? You couldn't forget my face now, could you? Zeke, I, I must have been dreaming. I, I was in a place far away, and, and you, and you, and you, you were all there. We were? But you, you couldn't have been, could you? Oh, we dream lots of silly things, dear, when we... No, Aunt Em, this was a real, truly live place. And all I kept saying to everybody was, I want to go home. And they sent me home. <laughs> oh, Toto, you believe me, even if nobody else does. Of course we believe you, Dorothy. Oh, anyway, Toto, we're home. And this is my room, and, and you're all here... And I'm never going to leave here ever, ever again. Because I love you all. And, oh, Annie M., there's no place like home. So Goodbye to the Wizard of Oz, and congratulations to our lovely star, Judy Garland, and those remarkable characters from the land of Oz. 
Judy, we can't tell you how much we appreciate your giving up Christmas with your family to appear on the Lux Radio Theater. Oh, thank you, Bill, but I didn't really. You see, I brought my three-year-old, my four-year-old daughter, Liza. <laughs> says three in the script, but she's really four. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> I'd like to meet her. I'm afraid you're too late, cowardly lion. Liza fell in love with a scarecrow. He's teaching her to dance. Where is he? Let him put up his fist. I'll fight him with one paw tied behind my back. <laughs> Imagine only three uh, or four years old, <laughs> and there's two men fighting over her already. Well, that's because she's a Lux girl, Bill, just like her mom. Well, I can see you're bringing her up right, Judy. Now what are you girls going to do? Go home and eat more turkey? Oh, no, positively no more today. But I promised Liza if she was a good girl, I'd take her to the movie tomorrow. Well, why not take her to see Esther Williams in the Pagan Love Song? metro golden Mayor's new musical. Well, that sounds good. Liza loves singing and dancing. Then be sure she listens in next week, because we'll have another holiday special. Two of Hollywood's brightest musical comedy stars, Ginger Rogers and George Murphy. And we'll present them in metro golden Mayor's recent musical screen success, The Barclays of Broadway. Oh, well, we won't miss it, Bill. Good night. Good night, Judy. And may your new year be a very happy one. Who is this Hollywood star? One of three beautiful sisters. She's written a best-selling book on charm. She's the glamorous mother of four lovely daughters. A glamorous mother of four? Uh How about Joan Bennett? Uh Right. And the girls are always as perfectly groomed as Joan herself. Of course, she insists on Lux care for all their washables as well as her own. Everything from dainty party dresses to two-year-old Shelley's gay cotton play clothes. Hollywood stars love gentle Lux because it keeps colors new-looking so much longer. Take a tip from Joan Bennett. Get a big box of Lux Flakes tomorrow. Give all the children's Christmas washables that lovely Lux look. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in hoping that you've all had a joyous Christmas. And be sure to join us again next Monday night when we'll present Ginger Rogers and George Murphy in the Barclays of Broadway. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Rudy Schrager. Stay tuned for my friend Irma, which follows over the...
Lux presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Maureen O'Hara, John Payne, and Edmund Gwen in Miracle on 34th Street. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Our Christmas present to you is the new Christmas classic of our time, Miracle on 34th Street. It's wrapped in a gay covering of laughter, tied with a bright ribbon of good humor, and decorated with the three sparkling stars of the 20th Century Fox picture. Reno O'Hara, John Payne, and Edmund Gwen. This is a wonderful story for the whole family. And perhaps some families may be gathered around a Christmas tree as they listen. Others will be putting up this happy sign of the season in a few days with lights and ornaments and the shining snow that can be made with Lux Flakes. Later, we'll tell you how to do this trick with Lux. But right now, it's curtain time for the play that proves there's a Santa Claus. Miracle on 34th Street, starring Maureen O'Hara as Doris, John Payne as Fred, and Edmund Gwen in his Academy Award-winning performance as Chris Kingle. It's Thanksgiving Day in New York City. On a broad avenue adjoining Central Park, an annual event is being joyfully awaited. The spectacular parade presented by Macy's Department Store to herald in the Christmas season. Away from the crowd are two of Macy's public relations experts. He's simply wonderful, Mrs. Walker. Just look at him on that float. The most realistic Santa Claus we've ever had. Why, he didn't even need any padding, did he? Padding? Why, didn't you notice his tummy? So round, so firm, so fully packed. Well, now that everything's under control, where on earth did you find him? I, I don't know. I, I just turned around and there he was. And to think that the man whose place he took was intoxicated. With a breath that would knock over a reindeer. Oh, just think if Mr. Macy had seen him. What if Mr. Gimble had seen him? Competition between our stores is tough enough. <laughs> well, the parade's starting. Let's stand at the curb. Not I, Mr. Shellhammer. I'm going home to relax. Anyway, I can see it from there. I live just around the corner. Oh, so you do. Well, I'll see you tomorrow, Mrs. Walker. And congratulations on finding the best Santa Claus in Macy's history. Certainly is a wonderful parade, Susan. Just look at that clown. Gosh, what a giant. Giant, Mr. Gailey? There are no such things as giants. Well, not now, maybe, but in olden days, there's... Really, Mr. Gailey? And you're a lawyer. Well, what about the giant that Jack killed? You know, Jack and the Beanstalk? Everybody knows that's a fairy tale. And I agree with my mother. Fairy tales are silly. Come in. Oh, hello, Mother. I'm watching the parade. Mr. Gailey invited me. Hello, darling. Susie's told me quite a lot about you, Mrs. Walker. She told me quite a lot about you, too, the man in the front apartment. <laughs> well, this is all part of a plot, Mrs. Walker. I'm very fond of Susie, but I I also wanted to meet you. At least you're frank. There's no Santa Claus. Oh, don't even mention the name. Why not, Mother? Well, that Santa Claus you see is a last-minute substitute. But why? Oh, remember the way the janitor was last New Year's? Oh, my. Tight as an owl. I, um, I see Susan doesn't believe in Santa Claus either. That's right. She never has. Well, that's the end of the parade. Mother, I've been thinking. It's Thanksgiving, and there are only two of us. Couldn't we invite Mr. Gailey? Well, I... Oh, uh, <laughs> please don't bother. I'll... I'll just have a sandwich or something. But we have such a big turkey. Please, Mother, please. Well, well, I... Did I ask her all right, Mr. Gailey? Susie, shh. <laughs> you asked fine, Susan. Dinner's at three, Mr. Gailey. Hey, 
Hello. Mrs. Walker? Yes, Mr. Shellhammer. Your maid said you were at Thanksgiving dinner, but I, I just had to tell you. Your Santa Claus was stupendous. Well, thank you. Mr. Macy himself wants him to be our toy department Santa Claus. Oh, fine. Can you hire him? Oh, 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 I already have. Oh, he's a born salesman. I just feel it. Good. We'll talk about it in the morning. Thanks for calling, Mr. Shellhammer. Here he is, Mr. Shellhammer. Here's Santa Claus. Oh, thank you, Alfred. Thank you, Good morning, Santa Claus. Good morning. Now, before you go to the toy department, here's a list of toys that we have to push. Huh? You know, things we're overstocked on. Now, you'll find that a great many children will be undecided as to what they want for Christmas. And when that happens, you immediately suggest one of these items. Do you understand? I certainly do. Fine, that's fine. Now, take the list and Alfred here will show you to your throne in the toy department. And don't you forget, you're working for Macy. Claus. Why, of course I am. What do you want for Christmas, little boy? I want a fire engine with a real hose that squirts real wet water. And I won't do it in the house. I'll only do it in the backyard. I promise. And I promise you'll get your fire engine. You see, Mama, I told you you'd get me one. <laughs> That's fine. That's just dandy. You'll wait here, Mortimer. Mama wants to thank Santa Claus, too. Yes, madam? So what's the matter with you? No, no, no. What's the trouble? I told you before, didn't I? The kid wants a fire engine, but there isn't one to be had anywhere in town. Macy's ain't got any. Gimbal's ain't got any. Nobody's got any. My feet are killing me, and you say, okay, he gets the fire engine. But you can get those fire engines at Schoenfeld's, Lexington Avenue. Only four fifty. a wonderful bargain. Schoenfeld? Yes. Hey, I, I don't get it. Oh, I follow the toy market very closely. Macy's sending people to other stores? Yes. Are you kidding? No. The one important thing is to make the children happy. Whether Macy's or somebody else sells the toy doesn't matter. Now, don't you feel that way? Who, me? Yes. Oh, yes, sure. Only I didn't know Macy's did. Hmm? I don't get it. I just don't get okay. it. Uh, who's next, please? Right this way to see Santa Claus. <laughs> All right, little girl. You're next. Of course, little girl. You want some roller skates? Well, you shall have them, too. Mama, Mama, he's going to bring me some roller skates. And he has some fine skates here at Macy's, haven't you, Santa Claus? Oh, they're good skates, all right, but, but not quite good enough. Now, I left some really wonderful roller skates at Gimbal's. I'm sure Gimbal's have just what this good little girl wants. Very good. Mr. Shellhammer, are you Mr. Shellhammer? Uh, uh, Gimbal's? Uh, Gimbal's? That's just what he did say, Gimbal's. Uh, the sales lady said I should speak to you. Gimbal's. I just wanted to congratulate you and Macy's on this wonderful new stunt you're pulling. Gimbal's. Imagine a big outfit like Macy's putting the spirit of Christmas ahead of the commercial. Gimbal's. From now on, I'm going to be a regular Macy customer. All right, Mortimer, we're going. <laughs> Gimbal's. <laughs> And there's the toy department over there, Mr. Gailey. You certainly know all about Macy's store, don't you, Susan? Well, that's because my mother works here. But I still think it's silly, bringing me here to see Santa Claus. Well, I just feel that when you've talked to okay, him, you might... Okay, Mr. Gailey. I'm certainly willing to try. Well, well, what a fine young lady, eh? What's your name, little girl? Susan Walker. What's yours? Mine? Chris Kringle. I'm Santa Claus. Mm. Oh, oh, you don't believe that, eh? Uh-uh. You see, my mother's Mrs. Walker. Oh, 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 oh. But I must say you're the best-looking Santa Claus I've ever seen. Really? Your beard, for instance. It doesn't have one of those things that goes over your ears. <laughs> That's because it's real. Just oh. like I'm really Santa Claus. Now, go ahead. Pull it. Oh, my... My goodness, it is real. Yes, yeah. And now what would you like me to bring you for Christmas? Nothing, thank you. Whatever I want, my mother will get. If it's sensible and doesn't cost too much. Oh. That's quite right, Susan. Oh, hello, Mother. Hello, Mr. Walker. Gailey. Hello. Um, the explanation for all this is very simple. Your maid's mother sprained her ankle. She had to go home, so she asked me to bring Susie down to you. And as long as we were here, I... I figured we might as well say hello to Santa Claus. He has real whiskers, Mother. Susan, would you mind standing over there a minute? If you want me to. I, um, 
I shouldn't have brought Susie to see Santa, is that it? Now you're making me feel completely heartless. I'm sorry. Don't you see? I tell Susan that Santa Claus is a myth. And you show her a very convincing old man with real whiskers. Well, whom is she to believe? Yeah, that's right, isn't it? When Susan was a baby, her father and I were divorced. And ever since then, I've protected my child by teaching her realities. If you don't believe in fairy tales and fantasy, you can never be hurt or disillusioned. We were talking about Susie, Mrs. Walker. And I must ask you to let me raise her as I see fit. All right, dear. The store's going to close soon. We'll run along to my office. Alfred said you wanted to see me, Mrs. Walker. Oh, um... Oh, yes. Come in. I, um... Uh... I'd be grateful if you would please tell Susan that you're not really Santa Claus. That there actually is no such person. Oh, but Mrs. Walker, not only is there such a person, but here I am to prove it. No, 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 no. You misunderstand. I, I want you to tell her the truth. Now, um, what's your real name? Chris Kringle. And I always tell the truth. Susan, I'll bet you're in the first grade. Second grade. I mean your real name. Well, that is my real name. My goodness, the second grade? Very well. I have your employment card right here. I'd look it up on that. Mm, that's a very cute dress you have on, Susan. It's for Macy's. We get 10% off. Oh. So, <clears throat> you always tell the truth, do you? Mm. Look at your employment card. Name, Chris Kringle. Address, Brooks Memorial Home, Great Neck, Long Island. You may call the home if you'd care to confirm that, Mrs. Walker. It's a home for elderly gentlemen. Would you also like me to confirm this? What's that? Date of birth. As old as my tongue and a little bit older than my teeth. <laughs> Place of birth. North Pole. <clears throat> now, really. Why, I believe you doubt me, Mrs. Walker. And this tops everything. Next of kin. Oh, that. Dasher, dancer, prancer, and vixen. <laughs> I'm sorry to have to do this, Mr. Um, um, uh, Kringle. But the, uh, the Santa Claus that we had two years ago is back in town, and I feel that we owe it to him to... Uh, what, have I done something wrong? Uh, no, 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 it's, it's just that we feel... Uh, oh, excuse me. Hello? Uh, this is Mr. Shellhammer, Mrs. Walker. Drop whatever you're doing. Mr. Macy wants to see us immediately. Oh, I'll be right up. Um, I'm afraid I'll have to be very abrupt with you. I have to see Mr. Macy. You'll be paid for the full week, Mr. Kringle, and uh, I'll send your check to that address. Oh, uh, come right in, Mrs. Walker, Mr. Shellhammer. Thank you, Mr. Macy. Now, about this new policy you two initiated. Uh, oh. Macy's Santa Claus sending customers to Gimble. Well, I, I, I can explain everything, Mr. Macy. You don't have I... to explain a thing. Just look at my desk. Forty-two telegrams and over 500 phone calls. Grateful parents expressing undying gratitude to Macy's department store. Why, you, you don't say. From now on, not only will our Santa Claus continue in this manner, but every salesperson in the entire store. You mean that if we haven't got what the customer asks for, we're to... We're to send him where he can get it. No high pressuring and forcing a customer to take something he doesn't really want. I think that's wonderful, Mr. Macy. Why, we'll be known as, uh, as the helpful store, the, the friendly store. The store that places public service ahead of profits. And consequently, we will make more profits than ever. <laughs> As for you, Mrs. Walker and Mr. Shellhammer, you'll find a more practical expression of my gratitude in your Christmas envelope. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Yes. And tell that wonderful Santa Claus I won't forget him either. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I'll tell him myself in the morning. Uh, yes, indeed, Mr. Macy. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Good night. Good, Good night, Mr. Macy. And thank you again, sir. <laughs> oh, Imagine a bonus. Yes. Well, what's the matter with you? Mr. Shellhammer, I just fired him. Who? Santa Claus. Oh, no, 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 no. No, you couldn't have. But I did. He, he's crazy, Mr. Shellhammer. He really thinks he is Santa Claus. I don't care if he thinks he, he's the Easter Bunny. Find him. <laughs> Act two of Miracle on 34th Street will continue in a moment. Well, Libby, have you given Santa your Christmas list? Yes, indeed, John. And number one on my list is a pair of Chinese pajamas with a three-quarter coat and little upstanding collar. 
Just like the ones Mata Torin wears in Rogue's Regiment. Perhaps you'd better have the wardrobe mistress of Universal International show Santa what you mean. Well, I'm sure Dick Powell or Stephen McNally could give him a good description. They found Marta very glamorous in this modern story of the French Foreign Legion. And what a villain Vincent Price is in Rogue's Regiment. Mm -hmm. I was on the edge of my seat through the whole picture. And you talk about a pair of pajamas. (laughs) Well, they were very special. Marta liked them so well, she had four pairs made for her personal wardrobe. And she was delighted when they told her she could lux them. That's about the easiest care in the world. Especially now with the new tiny diamonds of Lux. Another triumph of the famous Lever Laboratories. These tiny diamonds are so much faster, they burst into suds the instant water touches them. And make wonderfully rich suds that last and last. Don't colors look marvelous when they're luxed? So fresh and new. No wonder smart girls say they won't risk wrong washing methods. Tests prove that with gentle care with Lux Flakes really makes a difference. Lux slips in 90s stayed new looking three times as long. And that's just like getting three pretty slips for the price of one. A really thoughtful Santa would put a box of Lux Flakes in every lingerie gift next Friday night. Here's our producer, Mr. William Keeley. Act two of Miracle on 34th Street, starring Marina O'Hara as Doris, John Payne as Fred, and Edmund Gwen as Chris Kringle. It was a frantic few hours that Doris spent last night, rushing out to the Brooks Memorial Home in Long Island and assuring Chris Kringle that Macy's wanted him back as Santa Claus. Now Chris is again presiding over the crowded toy department, while in her office, Doris and Mr. Shellhammer... Don't you understand, Mr. Shellhammer? That old man with the nice white whiskers insists that he is Santa Claus. Why, he's out of his mind. What if he should have a... A fit or something. Oh, no, I've got to tell Mr. Macy. Yes, but maybe he's only a little crazy. Anyway, you can't be sure until he's examined. We'll send him to Mr. Sawyer. Sawyer? In personnel. He's paid to examine employees, isn't he? And now, by the way, <laughs> what do you think of this? What is it? A full-page ad. Macy's is running in tomorrow's newspapers. Macy's is running it? But it's all about the other stores, Gimbel's and Sacks I know, and... I know. Mr. Macy's idea to help our customers find what they want. It's revolting, isn't it? That Santa Claus certainly has started something. Oh, well. I'll get a hold of him in his lunch hour and send him up to Mr. Sawyer. So I changed my clothes, Mr. Sawyer, and came right up. Oh, well, then that's your own beard, huh? Oh, yes, yes. Mm. Interesting complex in back of that. Why do you carry a cane? Always carry a cane, Mr. Sawyer. Well, that is when I wear street clothes. Hmm. I carved this cane out of a runner from one of my old sleighs. What's that? What's that? With a fine, solid silver top. Oh. <clears throat> who was the first president of the United States? Oh? Oh, give me a difficult one. <laughs> like, who was who was vice president under James Monroe. I'm conducting this examination. The answer is Daniel D. Tompkins. Oh, yes. Yes. You're a... You're a rather nervous man, aren't you, Mr. Sawyer? Hmm? (laughs) Tell me, do you, um... Do you get enough sleep? My personal habits are no concern of yours. Now, what hand am I holding up? Right hand. How many fingers do you see? Three. Oh, dear, oh, dear. You bite your nails, too. Oh. Oh, Stand up now. Feet together. Arms extended. Muscular coordination tests. I've taken dozens of these tests. Mr. Sawyer, are you happy at home? What? (laughs) That will be all, Mr. Kringle. The examination is over. Thank you. Yeah, and it may interest you to know I've been happily married for 22 years. Very happily married. Delighted to hear it. Goodbye, Uh, Mr. Sawyer. Miss Paul. Yes, sir. Get Mrs. Walker on the phone. Yes, sir. But your wife, Mr. Sawyer, she's called four times already. Now, you tell my big fat wife to shut up and mind her own business. (laughs) Here's Mrs. Walker, sir. All right. Hello. Oh, I I was just going to call you, Mr. Sawyer. Oh? There's a Dr. Pierce stopping by this afternoon at three. Who's Dr. Pierce? He's the physician at the Brooks home. I thought we might discuss Mr. Kringle's case with him. Oh, well, there's hardly any point in discussing it, Mrs. Walker. Obviously, the old man should be discharged. So, 
Dr. Pierce. Kringle should be dismissed immediately and sent to a mental institution. Oh, now, just a minute, Mr. Sawyer. Ah, he's deluded saying that he's Santa Claus. It's a delusion for good. I found he only wants to be friendly and helpful. Uh, his whole manner suggests aggressiveness. Look at the way he carries that cane. Mrs. Walker, naturally, I can't discharge that loony, so when he exhibits his maniacal tendencies, please realize the responsibility is completely yours. Well, I'm right back where I started. Mrs. Walker, I assure you, Chris Kringle has no maniacal tendencies. But if there's the slightest possibility of us causing any trouble... What I... trouble? All that needs happen is a policeman ask his name. Chris Kringle, clang, clang, and Macy Sa Santa Claus lands up in the psychopathic ward. Well, you can prevent that very simply. Now, there must be someone here at the store who could rent him a room. Then they could both come to work together. I just as soon he avoided that long train ride to Long Island, anyway. You mean, sort of take custody of him? Mm-hmm. Do you think that Mr. Kringle would agree to that? Oh, I'm sure he'll agree. Well, in, in that case... Uh... Now, let me see. Who do I know who could rent him a room? you're going to have dinner with us, Mr. Kringle. Oh, thank you, Susan. I'm also very glad you're going to live next door with Mr. Gailey. Oh, why? Because you're nice to talk to. Oh, <laughs> I say, what a fine young man that Mr. Gailey is, eh? Just think, allowing me to share his apartment, a mere stranger. He did it because Mother hinted to him. Oh, well, anyway, I'm very grateful. Shall I tell you what I did in school today? Oh, by all means. Any games? Yes. And a very silly game, too. Oh? They played zoo, and each child was supposed to be an animal. Oh, but Susan, they were just pretending. But that's what makes the game so silly. Oh. Well, of course, in order to play games, you need imagination. Oh, uh, that's when you see things, but they're not really there, huh? Oh, yes. Yes, but, you know, to me, imagination is a place all by itself. Now, you've heard of the French nation. Mm hmm? Hmm? And the British nation. Yes. Well, this is the imagination. <laughs> no. A very interesting place, too. Now, how would you like to be able to make snowballs in summertime, eh? What? Or be the Statue of Liberty in the morning, and in the afternoon, fly south with a flock of geese? Well, I'm quite sure I'd like it, but... Oh, it's very simple. Very. Well, anyway, look here. The next time they play zoo, you can be a monkey. But I don't know how to be a monkey. Don't you? Oh, I'll show you. Now, first, you bend over a little, like, uh, like this, see? Now, let your arms hang loose, see? Like this? Yeah, that's fine, fine. Now, put your hand over here and start scratching, see? Yeah. That's it. That's it. That's excellent, Susan. That's as fine a bit of scratching as I've ever seen. Yeah. Now, now you start chattering. Chattering? Yes, now listen. See? And keep scratching. Now then, look here. We'll do it together, see? Chatter and scratch and scratch and chatter, see? That's fine, Susan. Fine. You're doing beautifully. Beautifully, yes. <laughs> Susan. Susan. Are you still awake? Uh-huh. I've, uh... Just coming to say goodnight, Susan, that's all. Now, look here, about Christmas. There must be something you'd like for Christmas. Well, I've certainly thought about something, Mr. Kringle. You have? Well, what is it, eh? Tell me. It's right here on the night table, see? Oh? I tore this page out of a magazine. It's a picture of a house. Oh, -ho! that's what you want, is it? A doll's house. Colonial architecture. Oh, not a doll's house, a real house. A real house? Yes. And if you're really Santa Claus, you can get it for me. Now, 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 wait a minute, Susie. <laughs> what could you possibly do with a big house? Live in it with my mother. And a backyard with a big tree to put a swing on. And a garden and a... Oh, well. Why even discuss it? Susie. Susie, could I, uh... Could I keep this picture? Just, uh, just in case? I guess so. Thank you, dear. Thank you. Well, Mr. Gailey's waiting for me. Good night, monkey. Good night, Mr. Kringle.
Take whichever bed you want, Mr. Kringle. You're very kind, really. Uh, tell me, Mr. Gailey, what is it you just do for a living, eh? Oh, I'm a lawyer. Haslip, Haslip, Sherman, and Mackenzie. Oh. Hmm. And you, uh, you like living here in the city? Well, it's convenient. But someday I'd like to get a place on Long Island. Huh. Not a big house, just one of those junior partner deals around Manhasset. Oh, one of those little colonial houses, eh? Yeah. 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 A little colonial house would be swell. Good, good, yes. Yeah. You're, um, <clears throat> you're quite fond of Mrs. Walker, aren't you? <laughs> a lot of good it does me. She lives in a cast iron shell that's just a little difficult to penetrate. Oh. Well, you must try a little harder, Mr. Gailey. You know, Mrs. Walker and that child are a couple of lost souls. And it's up to us to help them, see? No. Yes, yeah, she... Oh, well, shall I turn out the light? No, no, no. no? I'm not going to be cheated out of this. You know, all my life I've wondered about it, and now I'm going to find out. Tell me, does Santa Claus sleep with his whiskers outside or inside the cupboard? <laughs> Outside, of course. Outside, by all means. The cold air makes them grow. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, uh, come in, Mrs. Walker. Come in. Thank you, Mr. Macy. I've just heard something very exciting. You have? Well, let me tell you something very exciting. Our policy of being kind to customers has tripled our sales. Now, what do you think of that? That's wonderful, Mr. Macy. And Gimbals thinks it's wonderful, too. Gimbals? Gimbals are adopting the same policy. Well, is that so? And it gives me an idea. As long as Gimbals are doing the same thing, why not some pictures for the newspapers? Uh, pictures? Yes. You and Mr. Gimble shaking hands. Shaking hands? R.H. Macy and... and Gimble? Well, well, yes. Yes, yes, why not? With Santa Claus. It's a great idea, Mrs. Walker. Macy and Gimbel shaking hands. Thanks, Mr. Oh, Macy. That, that's enough pictures, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. Gimbel? Come on, R.H. Now we'll go over to my store and get some really good pictures. Oh, just a minute. I have something here for Santa Claus. Here you are, Mr. Kringle. A check in appreciation of all you've done. Mr. Macy, why, that's most kind of you. I didn't think you were that generous, R.H. That's quite a check. What are you going to do with it, Mr. Kringle? Well, I have a friend, a Dr. Pierce. He needs a new x-ray machine. You buy the machine through the store. Ten percent discount. Nonsense. Come over to Gimbel's. We'll furnish it at cost. Oh, keep it up, gentlemen. Keep it up. <laughs> at this rate, my friend will have a whole new hospital. <laughs> How did the pictures turn out, Mr. Kringle? Oh, fine, Alfred. Fine. How about a game of checkers during lunch, eh? Oh, not today, Chris. I, I don't feel so good. Oh, What's the matter, Alfred? Oh, nothing much. You remember I was telling you how I like to play Santa Claus over at the Y and give out packages to the kids? Yeah. Well, I was telling Mr. Sawyer about it, and he says that's very bad. That psychologically, it's all wrong. Wrong? To be nice to children? Well, he says guys who play Santa Claus do it because when they was young, they must have done something bad. Now they do something they think is good to make up for it, see? <laughs> it's what he calls a guilt complex. Alfred... What else has he found wrong with you? Oh, nothing much. Just that I hate my father. <laughs> I didn't know it, but he says I do. Excuse me. Hey, ain't you going to have lunch? Later. Right now, I have an appointment with Mr. Sawyer. mean breaking into my office like this? Are you a licensed psychiatrist? What business is it of yours? I have great respect for psychiatry and great contempt for meddling amateurs who go around practicing it. Oh, would you shut up. You ought to be horsewhipped. Taking a boy like Alfred and filling him up with complexes and phobias... I and think I'm better equipped to judge that than you. Just because Alfred wants to be kind to children, you tell him he has a guilt complex. Yes. Having the same delusion, you couldn't possibly understand. Oh. And don't you wave that cane at me. Either you stop analyzing Alfred, or I'll go straight to Mr. Macy and tell him what a contemptible fraud you oh, are. Man, get out of here. Get out of here before I have you thrown out. There's only one way to handle a man like you. Maybe this will knock some sense into you. Oh! 
Oh, help! Oh, my head! My head! Oh! Good day, Mr. Sawyer. Miss Prawn! Get me the police! Get me Mrs. Walker! Get me the psychopathic ward in Bellevue Hospital! You can see Mr. Kringle now, Mr. Gailey. Thank you, nurse. Hello, Chris. Hello, Fred. Chris, I've been speaking to the doctors. They said they've given you some tests. Oh, yes. Same old tests. Except this time you failed to pass them. Chris, you deliberately failed. Why? Why? Well, because I had great hopes, Fred. I had a feeling Mrs. Walker was beginning to believe in me, and now... Well, now I discover she was only humoring me all the time. But this wasn't Doris's idea at all. Mr. Sawyer had you sent up here before she even knew about it. But why Why didn't she come to me and explain things? Because she didn't want to hurt you. Oh, well, it's not just Mrs. Walker. It's... Well, now, take Mr. Sawyer. He's contemptible, dishonest, deceitful. Yet he's out there and I'm in here. Well, if that's normal, I don't want it. But you can't just think of yourself, Chris. What happens to you matters to a lot of other people. People like me who believe in what you stand for and people like... Well, like Susie, who are just beginning to. Chris, you're letting us down. I... Well, Fred, maybe you're right. I... Of course you're right. I ought to be ashamed of myself. Let's get out of here. Now, wait a minute. You flunked your mental examination, but good. Oh, yes. So I did. Well, well, anyway, you're a lawyer. You fix it. Hey, look, I can't just... Now, I won't let you down, and you won't let me down. Chris, now take it easy. Look, there'll have to be a hearing. If you're going to be committed, it has to be before a judge. Well? Well, if I can do anything at all, it'll have to be in courtroom. Now sit tight, Chris. I'll get an idea. I have to get an idea. You, uh, uh, sent for me, Mr. Mason? I certainly did, Mr. Sawyer. I brought my family to the toy department to see our Santa Claus. And our Santa Claus isn't there. He's in Bellevue. Yes. Yes, Mr. Macy. Because he's a lunatic. Yes, sir. A l- lunatic. <laughs> lunatic, my foot. Now, you listen to me, Sawyer. You get that case dropped right away, or you'll have another lump to match the one he gave you. But it's out of my hands. Mr. Kringle goes to court in the morning. Well, just see that he's back in the toy department by afternoon. Now, get out of here. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Gailey. Yes? I've been looking all over for you. I'm Mr. <clears throat> Sawyer. Oh, so you're Sawyer. Yes. I uh, I was just speaking to the court clerk, and he said you represent Mr. Kringle. <clears throat> well, I represent Mr. Macy. Well, then I'll see you in court. Oh, no. uh, uh, that's what I wanted to speak to you about. Now, Mr. Macy would like to drop the whole case right now. You see, we're most anxious to avoid any publicity. No publicity, oh. huh? Well, that's very interesting. Oh, then you'll cooperate? You know something, Sawyer? You've just given me the idea I've been searching for. Oh, good, good. If I'm going to win this case, I'm going to have to have public opinion and plenty of it. And publicity's just the way to do it. Thanks. And uh, so long, Mr. Sawyer. Uh, Mr. Gailey? But Mr. Gailey! Look at these newspapers, Chris. Here. Evening Dispatch. Doctors doubt sanity of Santa who launched Goodwill Campaign. Oh, my. Daily Bulletin. Macy's Santa Claus to have lunacy hearing. What's this one? The New York Express. Is Chris Kringle crazy? Court case coming. Kiddies cry calamity. (laughs) You've driven the United Nations clear back to page five. Well, get a good night's sleep, Chris. We go before Judge Harper at ten tomorrow morning. Pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Our stars will return with Act Three of Miracle on 34th Street in a moment. When a new player signs a contract with 20th Century Fox, she soon gets well acquainted with Miss Helena Sorrell, head dramatic coach. Helena, 
Do you like to watch your pupils perform in the picture? Oh, of course, John, because I take a personal interest in them. I'm especially proud of Betty Grable and her new picture, When My Baby Smiles at Me. Betty's become a really fine dramatic actress. She certainly has. She and Dan Daly are magnificent as a couple of vaudeville hoofers. And Betty's costumes in When My Baby Smiles at Me gave me a thrill. And I was amazed how many things the wardrobe department washed with Lux Flakes. It reminded me of my theatrical days when I was on the road and lived in a couple of trunks. A box of Lux Flakes in each? <laughs> That's absolutely true, John. I was never without it, in my hotel or at the theater. Well, then, you, you've probably discovered that the new tiny diamonds of Lux are more wonderful than ever. They're so much faster and richer. Do more for you, too. They remove soil which other types of suds can't. Leave things cleaner. Pressure. And Lux Flakes keep colors lovely. You're right there. That's why it's foolish to risk wrong washing methods that may fade colors. Actual tests show that with gentle Lux Flakes care, colors stay lovely up to three times as long. That's a good tip for girls who get nice blouses and sweaters for Christmas. Right you are. And thank you for coming tonight, Helena Sorrell. We return you now to William Keeley. And the curtain rises on the third act of Miracle on 34th Street, starring Maureen O'Hara as Doris, John Payne as Fred, and Edmund Gwen as Chris. For a few weeks, a jolly elderly gentleman named Chris Kringle has been working minor miracles as Macy's Santa Claus. But now his sanity has been seriously questioned. And in a crowded courtroom... Judge Harper listens patiently as the assistant district attorney summons Chris to the witness stand. Now, uh, this is not a trial, Mr. Kringle. It's just a hearing, so you don't have to answer any questions. <clears throat> now then, uh, where do you live, please? Well, it seems to me that's what this hearing will decide, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Kringle, do you believe that you are Santa Claus? Of course I do. That's all, Your Honor. The state rests its case. Well, Mr. Gailey? Your Honor, Mr. Mara contends my client is not sane because he believes he is Santa Claus. An entirely logical conclusion. Anyone who thinks he's Santa Claus is crazy. Your Honor, you believe yourself to be Judge Harper. Yet no one questions your sanity because you are Judge Harper, do they? Mr. Kringle is the subject of this sanity hearing, not I. Well, Your Honor, I intend to prove that Mr. Kringle is Santa Claus. Mr. Mara. I thought you said this was a cut-and-dried sanity hearing. Well, I thought it was, Your Honor. Uh, <clears throat> in view of Mr. Gailey's statement, I'll have to review the entire background of this case. Court's adjourned till tomorrow morning. Hello, Doris. I'm sorry I'm late, but get ready. We're really going to celebrate tonight. What are we celebrating? Well, didn't you read the papers? Santa's mouthpiece throws bombshell on New York's Supreme Court. Oh, Fred, you're not really serious about this. You can't possibly prove that Chris Kringle is Santa Claus. Well, you saw Mr. Macy and Mr. Gimble shake hands. That wasn't possible either. What does your firm have to say about it? Hayslip and Mackenzie and, and the rest of them? That I've uh, jeopardized their prestige. And either I drop this impossible case or they'll drop me. You see? So I beat them to it. I quit. Fred! You threw away a career because of a sentimental whim? Well, I'll open my own office. And what kind of clients will you get? Oh, probably a lot of people like Chris who are being pushed around. That's the only fun in law anyway. Doris, look. Don't you have any faith in me at all? No, it's not a question of faith. It's, it's just common sense. But faith is believing in things when common sense tells you not to. It's not just Chris that's on trial. It's everything he stands for. Human kindness and love oh, and dignity. Oh, Fred, listen. We've seen a lot of each other the last couple of weeks. I, well, I've become fond of you. We've talked about some wonderful plans, haven't we? And then you do this. Go on an idealistic binge, throw away your security, and expect me to be happy about it. And I expect too much. Is that it? Well, that's that, I guess. Good night, Doris. <laughs> Hello. Yes, this is Mr. Mara. Well, can't it wait till tomorrow? I'm eating din... Who's been subpoenaed? Well, how do you think I feel about it? I'll see you tomorrow. Who's that, dear? R.H. Macy's been subpoenaed. Oh, my. Those reporters. 
they make me look like a sadistic monster who likes nothing better than to drown pussycats and tear wings off butterflies. Quiet, dear. Tommy's still awake. Oh, oh, yeah. It'd, it'd just break his heart if he knew what his daddy is doing. I'm doing my job as assistant district attorney. Well, I'm not so sure, but, I, but that I agree with them. Mr. Kringle looks like a very nice old man, and I don't see why you have to keep persecuting him. I'm not persecuting him. I'm prosecuting him. I like the old man, too, but, but there's nothing I can do about it. You know something, Thomas? Sometimes I wish I'd married a butcher or a plumber. Well, if I lose this case, it's very possible you'll get your wish. <laughs> R.H. Macy, I, I wonder what he's going to pull tomorrow. Proceed to the witness, Mr. Gailey. Now then, Mr. Macy, if you recognize the defendant, please tell us who he is. Why, Chris Kringle, of course. Do you believe him to be of sound mind? Sound mind? I wish I had a dozen like him. Mr. Macy, you are under oath. Do you believe that man is Santa Claus? Well, now, that's a rather a delicate... Uh... Just think of those headlines tomorrow. Macy admits his Santa Claus is fraud. You keep out of this, Gimble. What did you say? Yo, oh, 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 oh. No, nothing, Mr. Barber, nothing. <laughs> well, I wish you would. Is that man Santa Claus? Yes, in my opinion, he most certainly is. Your Honor, there is no such person as Santa Claus, and everybody knows it. Can you prove there isn't any? I won't even try. I'll not waste the court's time with such childish nonsense. Your Honor... The prosecution requests an immediate ruling from this court. Is there or is there not a Santa Claus? Well, now, uh, I, uh... The court will take a short recess to consider the question. Hello, Henry. Why, Charlie, what are you doing here? Can't an old friend visit you in your chambers? And if you ask me, you never needed a friend like you do now. This Kringle case... Well, I certainly don't see what they're making such a fuss about. Henry, that Santa Claus you've got out there, on trial for lunacy. This case is dynamite, and you're coming up for re-election soon. Charlie, you know what happened last night? Martha brought the grandchildren over. They, they wouldn't kiss Grandpa. <laughs> they wouldn't even talk to me. Ah, well, you see what I mean? If you rule there is no Santa Claus, you better start looking for that chicken farm right now. I'm a responsible judge. How can I seriously rule that there is a Santa Claus? Because of what happens if you don't. The kids read about it and they don't hang up their stockings. Now what happens to all the toys that are supposed to be in those stockings? Nobody buys them. The toy manufacturers have to lay off employees. By now you've got the AFL and the CIO against you. <laughs> yes, and they're going to say it with votes, see? Oh, and the department stores are going to love you, too. <laughs> yes, sir, Henry. And what about the Salvation Army? They got a Santa Claus on every street corner. They've taken a lot of money to help the poor. <laughs> but go ahead, Henry. You go in there and rule there isn't any Santa Claus. But if you do, you can count on getting just two votes, your own and that district attorney's out there. One vote, Charlie. He, he's a Republican. <laughs> Let's get this over with. The, uh, uh, the question of Santa Claus seems to be uh, largely a matter of opinion. The uh, tradition of American justice demands a broad and unprejudiced view of such a controversial matter. But, Your Honor... This court, therefore, intends to keep its mind open. We shall ask for evidence on either side. But the burden of proof clearly rests with my opponent. Can he produce any evidence to support his views? If Your Honor, please, I can. Will Thomas Mara please take the stand? Who, me? No. Thomas Mara, Jr. I believe he and his mother are both in court today. Hi, Papa! Hi. <laughs> Tommy, do you believe in Santa Claus? I sure do. Gosh, he gave me a brand new sled last year. Now, um, what does Santa Claus look like, Tommy? Well, there he is, sitting right over there. Your Honor, I protest. Overruled. Tell me, Tommy, uh, why are you so sure there's a Santa Claus? Because my papa told me so, didn't you? <laughs> Thank you, Tommy. You can go back to your mother now. See you later, papa. 
You certainly will. <laughs> Your Honor. Don't forget, Santa Claus. This year I want a football helmet. Don't worry, Tommy. You will get it. Mr. Kringle, if you don't mind. I'm sorry, sir. Your Honor, the state of New York concedes the existence of a Santa Claus. But in so conceding, we demand that Mr. Gailey stop representing and presenting personal opinion as evidence. I insist he submit authoritative proof that Mr. Kringle here is the one and only Santa Claus. Well, Mr. Gailey, are you prepared to show that Mr. Kringle is Santa Claus on the basis of unprejudiced authority? Well, sir, no, not now. I, I need a little time. Why not now? Tomorrow, Your Honor. Very well. Courts adjourned till tomorrow morning. Whew. Oh, brother. <laughs> Come, Susan, dear, finish your supper. But I can't, Mother. All those things they're saying in the newspapers about Mr. Kringle and Mr. Gailey. They're having this trial because he says he's Santa Claus. He's so, he's so kind and, and nice and jolly. He's not like anyone else I know. He must be Santa. You know something? I think perhaps you're right. Is Mr. Kringle sad now, Mother? I'm afraid he must be. Then I'll write him a letter. Maybe that'll make him feel better. I'll cheer him up. Oh, postman, postman. Yeah, lady? Would you mind taking this letter? Oh, sure, lady. We're going straight down to the post office now. Okay, Louie, take it away. Well, what do you know, Louie? Another letter for Santa Claus. Hey, here's a new one. Instead of the North Pole, this kid's got it addressed to Chris Kringle, New York County Courthouse. Well, the kid's right. Huh? Oh, yeah, sure. They got him on trial down there. <laughs> he claims he's Santa Claus and the D.A. claims he's nuts. Hey, hmm? hey, I got an idea. Huh? How many Santa Claus letters we got down there in a the dead letter office? Oh, who knows? Must be 50,000 bags and bags all over the joint. I... He... You mean... What, Flaky? Why not? Wouldn't it be nice to get rid of them all? Wouldn't it? <laughs> boy, oh, boy. Look, Louie, as soon as we get to the post office, we go and see the supervisor. You know something? I bet we both get promoted. <laughs> <laughs> defense has been unable to submit one shred of proof that Kris Kringle is the one and only Santa Claus, and since tonight is Christmas Eve, I ask your honor that this hearing be terminated without further delay. I protest I do have evidence. Five minutes ago you said you didn't. During Mr. Marrow's oration, the bailiff handed my client the evidence I refer to. What evidence? This letter, your honor. Oh, yes, Mr. Kringle. It's from Susan Walker. She believes in me. Oh, this letter means more to me than... Anything in the world. That letter, Your Honor, was delivered by the United States Post Office, an official agency of the federal government. The Post Office Department was one of the largest business concerns in the world. Last year, did a gross volume of over $1 billion. Your and this year... Your Honor, I'm sure we're all gratified that the Post Office is getting along so well. <laughs> but what bearing has it on the sanity of that man? My point is that the Post Office Department is a model of efficiency. Furthermore, the laws of this country make it a criminal offense to willfully misdirect mail or intentionally deliver it to the wrong party. The state of New York is second to none in his admiration of the post office department. We're very happy to concede Mr. Gailey's... Uh, Thanks. for the record, Mr. Mara. For the record. Anything to get on with this case. Thank you. Your Honor, that letter just received by Mr. Kringle is positive proof that a One competent... One letter is hardly positive proof. I have further exhibits, Your Honor, but I, I hesitate to produce them. Come, come, Mr. Gailey. Put them here on my desk. But, Your Honor, I, I don't... I said put them on my desk. All right, boys, bring them in. Your, your Honor, what, what is this? Empty those mail sacks on Judge Harper's desk. Yeah. Well, you... Well, but uh, bring them all in or be fined for contempt of court. Uh, no, no, just a second here. Uh, we'll do it, Your Honor, through rain, through sleet, through courtrooms, anything. We deliver. Uh, Mr. Gailey. Your Honor, every one of those letters and every one of those mail sacks is addressed to Santa Claus. The post office has delivered them. Therefore, the post office department recognizes Chris Kringle to be the one and only Santa Claus. 
Since the United States government declares this man to be Santa Claus, this court will not dispute it. Case dismissed. And for heaven's sake, get this mail out of my courtroom. So as soon as I got out of court, I came straight to Macy's to see you, Doris. Oh, Chris, I'm so glad you won. <sighs> well, we're having a big Christmas party at the Brooks' home tomorrow morning. I'd like so much to see you and Susan there. We'll be there, Chris. Oh, Chris, couldn't you, couldn't you come home now and have dinner with us? Now? Tonight? Me? My goodness, Doris, it's, it's Christmas Eve. Alfred, Alfred, look, look who came all the way out here to the home just for our Christmas party. Chris, it's, it's Mr. Macy. Mr. Gimble, too. Oh, excuse me, Alfred. Mrs. Walker and Susan have to leave now, and I want to see them before they go. So forgive me, will you? But, Susie, darling, you've got so many presents. Not the one I wanted. Not the one Mr. Kringle was going to get for me. Well, what was it? It doesn't matter. I knew I wouldn't get it, but I thought he'd at least tell me why. Susie. I'm sorry, Susie. I tried my best, but... You couldn't get it because you're not Santa Claus. Oh, Susan. Just a nice old man like Mother said. But I was wrong when I told you that. You must believe in Mr. Kringle and keep right on doing it. You must have faith in him. But that doesn't make sense, Mother. Faith is believing in things when common sense tells you not to. What? I mean, just because things don't turn out the way you want them to the first time, you've still got to believe in people. I found that... Hello, Doris. Fred. Mr. Gailey, Mr. Gailey. Merry Christmas, Susie. Gosh, you'll just get here and... We're ready to leave. Oh, I've been here. Oh. And if you're ready to leave, I'll drive you home. Before you go, here. Here's a map I've made for you. You'll miss a lot of traffic. About four miles south, you'll see Ashley Avenue. Now, that's the street you want. Ashley Avenue. Thanks, Chris. And Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you, Fred. And to you, my dear. And to you, Susie. I believe, Mr. Kringle. I do. Silly, I suppose, but I do. I don't understand it, Fred. The map Chris gave definitely says Ashley Avenue. Well, we've been on Ashley Avenue now for... Stop the car! Oh, stop the car, please! Susie, what is it, darling? What's the matter? There it is! The house! The house! Susie! What in the world? She's running into that house. But at least there's no one home. It's, it's brand new. It's, it's just been built. Yeah, for sale, it says. For sale. What on earth is that child up to? Susie! Hey, Susie! Here I am! Up there! Now, come right down. You know you shouldn't run around in other people's houses. That's strange. I'll say. No, no. I mean this house. I've seen this house somewhere. I know I have. Maybe in a magazine or... Mother! It's our house. It's the one I asked him for, Mr. Kringle. Mr. Kringle? I know it is. Oh, you were right, Mommy. You were right. Susie. Mommy told me that if things didn't turn out just the way you wanted them at first, you've still got to believe, and I kept believing. And you were right, Mommy. Mr. Kringle is Santa Claus. Now where are you going? In back to see if there's a swing. There is one. Oh, there is one. You told her that? About believing? Well... You told me, Fred. <laughs> a sign outside. For sale, huh? Well, we can't let her down, can we? I never really doubted you. It was just my silly common sense. <laughs> it even makes sense to believe in me now. I must be a pretty good lawyer. I take a little old man and legally prove to the world that he's Santa Claus. Now, you know that couldn't be... Fred! What's the matter? There. In the corner. By the fireplace. Oh, no. No. It, it can't be. It, it couldn't. A cane. Chris's cane. Well, there couldn't be two canes like this anywhere in the world. Silver handle and all. Hey, you know something? Maybe I didn't do such a wonderful thing after all.
Before our stars return to their curtain calls, Libby Collins wants to tell you about the wonderful way to decorate your Christmas tree, as we promised at the opening of the show. You can give your tree that fresh-from-the-woods look by covering it with real-looking snow you make yourself from a box of Lux Flakes. So many people have asked for the Lux recipe for Christmas snow that we gave last week. We'll repeat it tonight. Listen carefully. Take a large box of Lux Flakes. Gradually add two cups of lukewarm water and beat with an egg beater until it has the consistency of thick whipped cream. Then, with your fingers, spread the mixture over the branches of your tree. And that's all. This snowy covering dries quickly, it won't melt, and lasts as long as the tree. Ask your dealer for a copy of this Christmas snow recipe. I don't know of any other decoration that costs so little, yet does so much for your tree. It looks lovely used just with tree lights, or you can add your usual ornaments if you prefer. Try it on your mantle decorations and table arrangements, too. It gives them a very professional look. And makes the whole house look more Christmassy. Now, I'll repeat that recipe. Take a large box of Lux Flakes. Gradually add about two cups of lukewarm water and beat with an egg beater. While moist, spread the mixture along the branches. If you want extra glitter, shake on some shiny artificial snow before the mixture dries. Let the children help. They'll love doing it and love the snowy tree. Back now to our producer, William Keeley. Mr. Kringle's reindeer are waiting on the roof. But we've asked him to pause a moment before he leaves and come back to the footlights with Maureen O'Hara and John Payne. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it was a real thrill to everyone in Hollywood when Edmund Gwen topped his entire 53 years as an actor with his great performance as Chris Kringle. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bill. Everyone connected with Miracle on 34th Street... From George Seaton, the author-director, to the prop man, help me. They all believed in Santa Claus. How could we help it? I suppose you've got a strenuous time ahead, Chris. Yeah? Covering the entire world in one night. John, if everyone believed in Santa Claus, peace would break out all over the world in 30 seconds. I hope you won't be too busy to stop at my house. I'll have my stockings hung up. Oh, well, I'll stop in, Marine, but... Seems rather futile. Why, Chris? Well, I couldn't possibly fill her stocking as well as she does. I see what you mean. <laughs> Bill, after that, I think you'd better tell us all about next week's play. Next week, Maureen, a play straight from your native land. It's the 20th Century Fox picture, The Luck of the Irish. And the stars? Well, we have a superb cast. There's Dana Andrews, Anne Baxter, and Cecil Calloway. This is a delightful romance, presided over by a most mysterious leprechaun in the person of Cecil Kellaway. I know you'll all enjoy it. We'll be looking forward to it, Bill. And good night. Good night. Good night. Can I give anybody a lift in my sleigh? <laughs> good night and a merry, merry Christmas. Before we meet again in this theater, the most joyful day in the year will have come and gone. And there are, in our time, as in every time, a few foolish men who deride the spirit of Christmas. But in every country and in every time, they are overwhelmed by those who find in it the hope and happiness of the future. By those of us who believe in our hearts that there can be peace on this earth and goodwill among all men. On behalf of Lever Brothers Company and of us in the Lux Radio Theater, may I wish all of you the happiest of holidays. And we invite you all to join us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Dana Andrews, Ann Baxter, and Cecil Kellaway in The Luck of the Irish. This is William Keeley saying good night and Merry Christmas. Maureen O'Hara appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of The Snake Pit, starring Olivia de Havilland and Mark Stevens. Edmund Gwen appeared by arrangement with Metro Goldwyn Mayer, producers of the All Star Technicolor musical Words and Music, based on the lives and music of Rogers and Hart. John Payne will soon be seen in the Paramount picture El Paso. 
Be sure to listen next Monday night to the Lux Radio Theater presentation of The Luck of the Irish, starring Dana Andrews, Ann Baxter, and Cecil Kellaway. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.